What's up, Milwaukee? Welcome to a long overdue edition of the Creek. Myself, 25 minutes to get a mile in LA traffic. Andrew Goodman. What's up, Drew? Good to be uh, here talking bucks with you finally after a long hiatus. But yeah, like you said, that LA traffic really is unforgiving for people in Wisconsin all over the world. If you're thinking about moving to LA, please don't. We already have hey. enough traffic as it is. <laughs> how, ma- how many more cars do you think were because of LeBron James being a Laker? <laughs> uh, easily 500,000 for sure. Everyone just flocking. Yeah. <laughs> Seems fair, right? I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think a couple of them got to be to go see Lance Stevenson and JaVel McGee there, oh, too. You can't so, I mean, JaVel and KCP, man. Yeah. I mean, the circus is definitely in town in LA, as it usually is, I'm yeah, sure, but even a little bit more. It. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about a little bit about everything that's kind of been on since the end of the season. Um, I guess we're gonna start a little bit on the draft uh, and the Bucks pick at number seventeen, Dante Divincenzo at a uh, Villanova. Um, you know, I think that it's a good pick for where they are. I mean, you're not gonna find many superstars at seventeen. I think there were a couple guys. Uh, I think there were a couple guys around there that they could have taken that maybe had a little higher upside, but uh, just wanted to hear, what's your thought? What are your thoughts on that? You know, at first when they selected DiVincenzo with the 17th pick, I was pretty disappointed, but then the more I watched film of him on both sides of the ball, I was really impressed. And something that I think stood out a lot and also stood out to a lot of people is his freakish athleticism. He actually measured the highest uh, vertical jump at the combine this year, 42 inches, which is insane. And he's six four and a half in shoes, and he has a six six wingspan, and he's also two hundred pounds. So, you know, he's got a good frame on him. So, I think he'll definitely step in, and I think he's already already one of the more elite athletes the Bucks have, which is pretty shocking yeah. to say, for sure. And I think that I think that he kind of does a lot of the things that uh, you need on a, like a contending team. He's a real gritty player. I mean, you know, he has that elite athleticism. He can shoot the ball, but He's not afraid of the moment, and you saw that in the national championship game against Michigan where he absolutely, I mean, if you want to see like a guy's a NBA draft prospects upside tape, that might be the best upside tape you could see on the biggest stage. And, you know, and a lot of recency bias, I think, kind of goes into it. So, you you know, you have to kind of take it for what it is. He's, you know, if he was so good, he would have been a lottery pick, but it was that kind of, all around consistency of, yeah, he's not going to give you 31 points like he did in the national championship game, but you know, he's going to be there as a reliable guy to knock down threes and play defense, which is kind of what the bucks are trending towards and what the whole NBA is trending towards as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. And you got to love the fact that he comes from a winning pedigree at Villanova and that team that he was on last year was totally stacked. And he put up average of 13.4 points per game, 4.8 rebounds and three and a half assists per game. You know, like I said, that team was really deep. And I guess the Bucks are really drafting him because he had one solid season, which seems like a big risk. But, you know, when you're drafting in the 17 range like the Bucks are, this is where you yeah. have to take a risk. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean, he can do a little bit of everything, too. It's not just that he's a great shooter and defender. I mean, you need him in a pinch to dribble to bring the ball up. He can do so. I mean, pretty switchable guy, one through, I mean – some threes i'm sure in some lineups he can do that um he's kind of a past there's some things that i do uh that do concern me a little bit you know some video was surfacing of him you know having trouble creating separation at the college level and you know at the nba level that's guys are on you real tight i mean especially if you're a shooter you know as good as divincenzo shot the ball last year and you know, he actually filled it up at the combine in a lot of those uh, games they have there with the other, uh, I think, 60 guys, 60, 70 guys that they invite there. So, I mean, he played good in that, and, you know, he's trending upwards. Uh, but he's a little on the older side, um, you know, three years at Villanova. And, you know, I like what you said about Villanova. I mean, that's a winning culture. And, uh, you know, we have we had ESPN's Eric Nem name on, uh, you know, before, and I caught him in the uh, post game press conference saying, you know, Villanova is a really pro style system at the college level, and you don't really find too many of those other than the blue chip program. So I think the transition into Budenholzer's system is going to be a little, little 
probably easy for him, uh, especially just because, you know, Villanova had a lot of guys scoring the rock. I mean, it wasn't just like, it wasn't just like Jalen Brunson was going off all the time. I mean, they had Bridges, Spellman, they had a lot of different guys. And if you think about how Atlanta's teams under Budenholzer had such good success, I mean, it was because everyone's getting involved. So, you know, hopefully that he can translate a little bit kind of, I, I don't know. I think it'll be a seamless transition for him. Yeah. I agree with a lot of, about what you said, but I really love his nickname, the big ragu. So, you know, you got the bucks, they have the big ragu, they have the Greek freak and they have the president. And I think this DiVincenzo pick can kind of work out in a favor like it did for Malcolm Brogdon, where he spent the extra years at Virginia. And we all know Virginia is a powerhouse with Tony Bennett. He runs a great system over there. But I really think some of this extra years at college is really overlooked, and I think it can play a big part in the development of a player. And I think that's the case for Dante. Sure. And I think that you see a lot of – a lot of the teams that need that transcendent talent taking those younger guys rather, you know, like a DiVincenzo or, you know, Jalen Brunson, you know, these Moritz Wagner, those guys are going later in the draft to teams that like are ready to almost take that step. And you kind of get that out of the three or four year guys. And I think that'll be, I think that'll be a trend we'll start to see. And as teams kind of move up more in the draft, I mean, I know Bridges got traded to the um, Suns, but if you think about it, Bridges almost fits what the Sixers are trying to do more because of him being kind of a couple years older, you know, playing at Villanova. I, so, I mean, is that getting a unprotected 2021 pick from the Heat will change anyone's minds pretty quickly. So I can't blame him there. But, uh, you know, I think – DiVincenzo has a has a good chance to make an impact this year. I, you know, I get nervous because Lonnie Walker went directly after him, a guy who was projected to go into the lottery. Um, but like John Horst said before the draft, he wants a guy that can do a little bit of everything, and I think Dion uh, Dante fits the bill on that one. Um, I don't know if you've been um, following kind of what they've been doing in the undrafted free agent market, but. Um, Brandon McCoy. Yeah, uh, that was a guy that was on some big boards too. Surprised he didn't get yeah. drafted. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it was kind of his playing style. He's a more of a back to the basket guy. Uh, but if you, you know, a good watch if you're if you want to kind of see what Brandon McCoy is all about. Uh, Frank Frank's Frankie Vision. I think he does a lot of the clippings on YouTube. Uh, he had a really good one where it kind of talks about the good and bad of. Brandon McCoy, where he played against DeAndre Ayton this year. And, you know, against DeAndre Ayton, he put up 33 and 12. So, I mean, you know, I think DeAndre Ayton was consensus the number number one pick by everyone. So, I mean, that that's a pretty promising tape. But he played at UNLV only for a year. Uh, super long, super athletic. But he might just need a little bit of transition time to kind of fit the NBA, what it is today. But you never know. I mean – that's the type type of guy I like to see the Bucks taking a risk on, and that's, you know, especially because he was supposed to be high second round and he slipped. So, well, hey, he slipped right into the Bucks' lap, which is great. And you know, I love the fact that the Bucks are reaching out to do this. You know, this is a time to take risk on prospects like this, where you know you get them in the summer league, let them get their feet wet, and you know, really prove to you that they're worthy of a roster spot. But let's transition here. We can't end this podcast without talking about free agency. Oh yeah. Big free agency period. Um, the Bucks only made one move. It was an early move, to say the least. Uh, but it was se- uh, seven million, so three years, twenty-one million. I believe the third year is a team option on Ilyasova. Um, so seven million a year. Um, I'm, he fits within the Bucks' current cap situation right now and you know obviously Turkish Thunder is is royalty to the Bucks fans so I think it's a I think it's a good move and I think you can get I mean hindsight's 2020 you see a lot of these guys that are kind of similar fitting into a cheaper you know one year deal like Mike Scott or uh you know Glenn Robinson kind of at the later part so I mean it's a little 
it's it sucks a little that way, but you know they they went after a guy that they thought could help this year, and they did it, and that's what I like to see decisiveness from the front office. What are your uh, initial thoughts on Ersan? Yeah, you know, I think the deal would have looked a lot worse if it was actually just for three deals, but I think this two years non guaranteed third deal helps a lot and it makes the deal a lot better. But I think, like you said, it really makes a lot of sense because he is exactly what the Bucks need. They need someone who can stretch the floor and knock down some threes, but they also need a guy who's not afraid to fight for rebounds. And I also think a really under uh, underestimated part of his game is the fact that he likes to take tar- charges. Yeah, I mean, we'll create a be, lot of extra possessions. Break out the charge card. Yeah, I mean, you'd be hard for, hard pressed to find someone that wanted to take charges on last year's Buck squad, other than Delhi. But um, and I think the le- the less we see a Delhi on the court in the future is going to be for the best. But you know, Ersan, he also kind of it, it kind of makes you think about what they're not so sure about signing Jabari because. Ursan is a kind of a stopgap at that four position, and can you can even stretch him out to the five at six ten at sometimes when him and Giannis are in the game together. And you know he's an intelligent player. He he can shoot the ball. He knows what he's doing. I mean he's played under Budenholzer for it was two campaigns like halfway, so I think it's like seventy two games total that he played to, under him. There. So I mean they. You know, Budenholzer is going to get the guys that he knows are going to perform. And, yeah. you know, he's the former player of basketball operations in Atlanta. And I think that you're going to see some connections between players from Atlanta to Milwaukee. And, you know, as the, as the Hawks go into rebuilding mode and, you know, they got Trey Young now, you got to think that Dennis Schroeder is going to be on the move. And who knows what's going to happen with Eric Bledsoe in the next year, Brogdon, I mean – there's going to be a lot of turnover in this roster at some point, although we are cap restricted in the next couple of years, you're going to see some movement and I wouldn't rule out Atlanta in a possible sign in trade for uh, Jabari because, you know, if we Kent Bazemore's contracts pretty big, but I think I like Kent Bazemore in this offense a lot better than I do Jabari Parker. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because I feel like whenever the Bucks and Hawks play each other, Kent Bazemore always kills the Bucks. And I really like Ken Bazemore a lot. I think he's a great Swiss Army knife to have. He can defend. He can knock down threes. He's pretty underrated athletic time, uh, too, so he can definitely get to the rim. But like you said, it's really weird, the Jabari Parker conundrum. It's like the market's dried out. You know, you see Julius Randle signed for two years, I believe it was $18 million with the Pelicans. And, yeah, you know, one and one, too. Yeah, which is a pretty good deal for New Orleans, I think, but... You got it. Got to have you wondering what's going on with Jabari, especially after they go out and sign Urson. Yeah, I mean, I think Jabari is was unfortunately was in the wrong year for free agency, um, which kind of makes me a little concerned that he's going to take that qualifying offer for a year and four point three. Um, I'm thinking that's actually becoming more likely, either that or a sign in trade. Um, the Bucks kind of bought themselves some time with kind of a weird 12 hours of events where they guaranteed Brandon Jennings contract and then all of a sudden didn't. But, you know, they bought themselves some time by pushing that back to August 1st. And um, I think I think they're going to have to make a decision with Jabari. I mean, if it's if it's around 13 to 16 million anywhere in that ballpark, I think that's something that especially with LeBron moving West. I think that's some, you know, and I'm not talking about a long-term deal. I'm saying like two in a team option or a player, a two in a team option on that last one, because you got to protect yourself here because if he gets hurt again, you're, you're in some deep stuff there and you're screwed. You're, you're yeah, screwed. you are. But you know, the other part is, and I'm sure, you know, it's keeping a horse awake at night, but you know, you let him go and he started and he's fine and he's averaging 20, 25 on a team. You know, that's where it gets a little hairy. Can you can you watch Jabari Parker go and do that while he's, you know, he's still an able and ready player, but it's just that injury. I mean, I think the defense is going to get better, but, you know. Yeah, like, you know, even just the slightest defensive improvement can mean a lot for the Bucks team. And, you know, there's no secret that Jabari is still very talented and athletic. But, you know, like you said, it's those two torn ACLs that are really concerning. And when you have 
two injuries that are that significant, you know, within a short time frame, it, it's going to put a lot of pressure on you. And I think Jabari didn't have enough time after the second injury to come back and fully get prepared and then got thrown into the ringer in the playoffs. But, you know, I've been very outspoken on Jabari and his inabilities on offense and on defense. But I think for the right price, you definitely got to sign him because there's definitely talent there for sure. Yeah, and I, and I think that, you know, Jason Kidd's system and, you know, Joe Pronti tried to make some tweaks at the end of the season. But if you think about it, Jason Kidd's system wasn't built for a defensive player like Jabari. I don't even think it was built for an NBA player. I mean, yeah, you because can say like – but, like, you know, you got to think that Budenholzer, I mean, his teams were consistently, you know, in the top 10 for defensive ratings when the, he was with Atlanta and they had all their good pieces. So you got to think that his scheme itself is going to help mask Jabari, Jabari's weakness at some point. And, mm-hmm. you know, you also got to think about when Jabari got put into the season at the end of the year, the Bucks already had something going. And they had kind of what they were supposed to, although wasn't good. He kind of threw a wrench and everything because everyone knew their kind of roles on defense. While Jabari, he takes plays off on defense. And, you you know, there's no other, I'm, you know, I hate to say that about him because I think that he's super talented and he can really help this team win. But I think he's just got to be there. And you did see it in the playoffs just a little bit. I mean, he finished the, at, when the first round was over, he finished with the third lowest uh field goal percentage allowed on them by 35 percent so i mean it's there you just gotta make sure that it's there every day yeah and i think jabari is the type of guy that really feeds greatly off of positive reinforcement and after jason kidd got dismissed we were reading that he would go at it with players and like play mental games with him which is really hard to understand you know an nba coach would do that it's just really excuse my language fucking stupid but, I mean, I think yeah. Budenholzer is one of the best coaches in the NBA in terms of creating, you know, good chemistry in the locker room. And there's actually a really nice long write-up on the New York Times about Mike Budenholzer and how his staff, you know, they tailor make activities and whatnot, workouts to create chemistry. And I think that'll go a long way for Jamari if he does end up resigning. Yeah, and, like, just how you were saying about kids' relationship with the Bucks players, I mean – and, you know, he, he said, I, I don't know if it was in the Players' Tribune or if it was just a report. They said that he hadn't talked to Jason Kidd, like, in, like, months when he was injured. And, you know, that's, that's just not how you – that's just not how you go about it at all. I mean, even when Ben Simmons was hurt, you know, he was in the practice facility every day getting better. He's not out there doing his own thing. And it's just – I think it starts with – the Bucks tr- kind of just tried to rush things, and they tried to say, you know – it, it, the NBA is a relationship business as much as you want. It is. And if you put a player like Jabari, who's, you know, he, he's, he knows what he wants in life and his job and his life. Like he's a very, he's a smart kid. I mean, he really is. And you just got to understand that you got to be a player's coach. And I think, you know, Budenholzer has learned some stuff from Pop that is really going to help. And I take that Popovich tree very seriously. And I think that, you know, anything Popovich touches turns to gold except Kawhi Leonard. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's just I, I trust Mike Budenholzer. And, and we don't really talk about Budenholzer because I think a lot of us just think he's going to go in there and make an effortless transition and make us a 50-win team. And I think that's going to be the case because you got to think, I mean, you're taking a couple losses to Cleveland off the board. You're taking probably – I mean, the East is getting substantially worse. Yeah, it so definitely you, is for sure. So now what now that the Bucks got to do is figure out how we get into the Philadelphia and Boston category. You, you know, Giannis went on the herd, said he's going to stay in Milwaukee. He wouldn't leave for L.A., but let's think about it here. For four years, 100 – Four years left on, I think four years left on his deal. Yeah. He's starting it this year, his $100 million deal. You got to, you got to do whatever you can to, you got to do some, you got to do whatever you can to surround him and Middleton with what they need. And, 
you know, you almost have to cater him to Le- to LeBron. I mean, I don't think Giannis knows what he needs because I think LeBron's basketball IQ is just through the roof. So you kind of have to t- just kind of guess at what Giannis wants, but you can tell what he needs. Yeah. He needs sh- he needs shooters all over. You know, it seems like a simple equation, and this goes back to last year's free agency where, you know, the Bucks kind of pounce on Tony Snell, and, you know, you saw what he did last year, which is pretty much nothing. So, you know, like you said, I do believe that Budenholzer is going to come in and the Bucks are going to be a 51 team, if not more, because they won around 45 games, 44, 45 games last year. And that was with Jason Kidd and Joe Prunty. And we all know Jason Kidd was just a terrible players coach and Budenholzer being one of the better ones in the league is definitely going to make a huge difference for the Bucks. And I think the Bucks made yeah. that higher knowing that, you know, this was going to be a change for the, for the good. I mean, I just think that we're so used to the Bucks underperforming with what they are. I mean, they weren't the seventh best team in the NBA. They were led to the seventh best team, or not in the NBA, in the Eastern Conference, excuse me. They were led to the seventh seed by their coaching. They were, and their GM. The roster itself, I think, was probably good enough to, you know, we're better than Indiana. Victor Oladipo had a great season, but Nate McMillan, he knew what he was doing. He took what he had in front of him, and he made them great. So now we got to think about we have a great coach. He's going to take what they have in front of him and make him great. I mean, you know, Thon Maker came into his own in the playoffs. If Thon can play like that without the ninja kicks, like, (laughs) yeah, we'll talk. We will talk about that very soon here. Um, You know, if if he can play even – 60 you know two-thirds of the game like he did in two-thirds of the season like he did in the playoffs i mean how much better does that make the bucks i mean it really if you think about it mm-hmm. realistically yeah but, i mean yeah let's talk about that thon maker uh what was that high knees what was that all about he lo- i don't know he just like he looked like a horse out of the stable for the first time <laughs> that's like so of a comparison he he did. He was like just so excited. I mean, first of all, I don't think the Philippines should be allowed to play in a FIBA tournament no, ever absolutely again. Not. That was disgraceful. Because I understand Manny Pacquiao's from there, but that's not how we do sports. Like, it's just not. I mean, I wish Kane was here for this because he would probably just have such a heartfelt message for all of us. <laughs> Kate, Kane Pittman, our Australian correspondent on Cream City Central. Um, but, you know, I don't blame Thon for doing what he did because his teammates were getting rocked. Yeah. Rocked out there. Too. It was bad. Yeah, dude. Like, they were throwing I – don't, I don't think that guy who threw the chair was from the Philippines. Yeah, I just think he, he just kind of – WWE was, move right there. I think he just wanted to get on the action. He's like, all right, well, I'm just going to throw a chair or whatever. You yeah. Know? Uh, that's, I'm pretty sure that's assault. Yeah, with a deadly weapon. For sure. I but, mean, it was. Yeah. I don't think I don't I'm think, happy that I'm happy that. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say I don't think Thon did anything wrong. You know, you look at what he was doing. It kind of looked like he was just trying to create some space in between all the ruckus. You know, Thon. You know, we all know yeah. Thon. He he wouldn't hurt a fly. For real, he wouldn't. And if you like, I, lo- I love looking at the courts, like the court like level angle, because Thon is just so much bigger than everyone. Not like bigger, like muscular wise or anything, but like he just looks like stretch out there. Like, yeah, he, from he Fantastic like, Four. It's really hard to describe what he looks like. I don't know. For me, he kind of looks like a daddy long legs with all the long arms and the legs just coming at you. It's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, for real. I don't. I don't even know what to say about that. I hope they, I, you know, I hope the NBA doesn't suspend him because, you know, if you look at it perhaps in like in context, I don't think it's that bad. I mean, maybe he'll get suspended for, I don't know if FIBA made a ruling or anything like that, but I, I don't think that it's worth conduct just detrimental to the league. I, I mean, he, what he made everyone laugh. It's not like he like threw a punch at anyone. Yeah. I mean, maybe he was just doing it for the Twitter clout. Now you could be on to something. <laughs> now you could be on to something there. I mean, gosh, if he could just have that much enthusiasm during the games. 
Yeah, it's like maybe what if we just took playoff thon and just morph that into eighty two game per season thon? Seriously. Could be like a sixty one like, bucks team if we're being I, honest. I like averaging four blocks I, a game, which is like really unrealistic, but still. I don't even know how he like literally I've never seen a switch, an actual switch in my life. That's even bigger than LeBron and regular season to postseason. Dude, he was out there. He made such an impact on, and he was hitting big threes. I mean, the BMO Harris Bradley Center, rest in peace. You know, I'm I just did the sign of the cross for you guys, just to let you know. <laughs> but I mean, it was rocking. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. Thon was Thon was really good. So I mean, we just got to hope that Budenholzer is gonna get some consistency out of him. You know, Snell, just give him confidence. And, you know, DJ Wilson, I mean, that's another thing. Like, if Jabari doesn't sign, DJ Wilson just got catapulted into a Uh, role on uh, this team. (laughs) Don't really know if I'm (laughs) very enthused by the prospect of playing DJ Wilson anything north of, like, five minutes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, his summers looked fun though on Instagram. I mean, it looks like he's having a good time. I mean, I guess if you got it, flaunt it, right? Yeah, right. I mean, I don't see him doing many workouts. I mean, but I guess not everyone posted posted workouts on the gram. But DJ, if you're listening, which probably not, I, I'd like to see you post a little, a few. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to let, see you do a couple more workouts on your IG. That'd be big time. Like, I hate to be that guy, but I, you know, Chris Middleton. I don't know if you saw, but he was in the Netherlands. I guess hosting a basketball camp, doing some cool videos. He came back yeah. a few days ago, and he already posted on his uh, Instagram that he's already in the gym in Milwaukee, like putting in work. Nice. I'm gonna have to go visit him. I need to go to the gym. Yeah, right. Let's go. It's hot, it's hot out though. Really? It's well, been how hot, hot is it out day. there? Uh, I don't know. It was last weekend, like the heat index. It was at, like a hundred or so. Yeah, dude, like it was a like, hundred here in LA, which is like really, really hot for LA for sure. All right, dude, that's fine. You don't have to keep flaunting about the weather there. Um, <laughs> it just has to be in the winter. <laughs> yeah, right. In the oh gosh, in the winter, I'm gonna come and bunk with. I'm gonna come and bunk with you, and we'll just yeah. get. We'll just split. We'll just we'll just split the league pass, and we'll be sad. Hey, I mean, I got an extra room here. You're more than welcome. Hey, hey. Um, I just wanted to talk, uh, touch base really quick on uh, Buck Summer League that's coming up in the next few days here. Um, they're going to be playing in the Las Vegas Summer League. Um, I know that uh, the Orla- not the Orlando, the Sacramento uh, Summer League has started the California Classic. Marvin Bagley, <sighs> give me that. Um, and then I think the Utah has a Summer League going on right mm-hmm. now as well. Yeah. Trey Young, so- they started yesterday, I think. Yeah, so uh, the Bucks summer league team is going to be pretty good. Uh, you're going to see former or like current Bucks uh, Sterling Brown, DJ Wilson, Dante DiVincenzo on the team. Uh, I believe I think the Bucks actually signed Brandon McCoy to a two way contract, if I'm not mistaken. That's smart. Um, I think that's I think yeah, it's a smart move. So and you'll see a lot of him in summer league. You'll just kind of figure out what he's doing. Uh, we also have a senior citizen on our summer league team. Perry Ellis will be joining us. Oh for God, I this. can't stand that guy. Oh, oh, Perry Ellis, I hated him when he was at Kansas. Sorry, did dude. Did we just lo- did we just lose a viewer for the summer league? Uh, I think we did, just based off that <laughs> premise. Oh, God. I mean, hey, Perry Ellis is just trying to get his dude. He like, looks like I don't an know. old man. He looks like he's fifty. He did have that hairline when he was in college. I was gnarly. Um, I'm not. Sh- I'm trying to look at where the dates are for the summer league, but you guys have Google too, so you can find them. But I believe it starts. Uh, oh, here you go. Friday, this Friday, they have a game against Detroit on the sixth. They play Dallas. Oh, I'm sure Giannis will be there for that one. On the Sunday the eighth, and then they play Monday the ninth against Denver. So the trip, the three D's: Detroit, Dallas, and Denver. Is Giannis's brother going to be playing for the, Dallas? I believe so. Yes, oh, he will be on the summer league roster. So, 
So we'll see. That's what I was thinking, dude. If we got a pick from Indiana, dude, I thought we were going to go up and get him. But I think when they saw that Brandon McCoy wasn't going to get drafted, I don't even think they worried about giving up anything, you know, because, I mean, Brandon McCoy is pretty much a second round pick by all, by my account. And you got him for no assets. You got him for nothing. So, yeah. Even so better. I'm thinking, yeah. I mean, it's not like we have anything to give up, but. We'll see. I mean, I'm excited. I'm excited for summer league though. Should be good. Yeah, it's always Should are you gonna fun. go out? Go out to any of the games? Uh no, I do not have a plane. No, you don't have the PJ. I do not I don't have a pr I don't have a PJ. PG might be able to loan me his after a <laughs> yeah, seven year two ninety. Yeah. Come on. Hey Paul George, if you're listening, just send it send a send a private chat my way. Um no, I wanted to. My birthday is on Sunday, so I, I was happy trying. early birthday. Yeah, thank you. Twenty, feeling twenty-two as Taylor oh, Swift said. Chris Middleton, welcome to the Chris Middleton years. Yeah, I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm pretty consistent twenty-two, but you know, there's room to improve still. But I yeah, I'm, you take nights I'm, off. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm also concerned that my twenty-one was pretty good, so my. So my 22 might be. Eh, you don't have a letdown. A little, <laughs> a little questionable. So that's funny. All right. Well, I think I think we're good. Did we cover everything you want yeah, to cover? I think that, yeah, else? we're good. All right. Well, I think maybe we'll touch base uh, if there's a new free agent signing. But definitely uh, after the summer league session, we'll definitely touch base and of kind of do a recap on see where we're at. Big, yeah, see what the big ragu's up to. So. That works good for me. Uh, you can follow Andrew on Twitter at Andrew underscore Goodman three. Yes, sir. And you can follow me at DP double underscore hoops. Look for at cream city central on Twitter. Check out creamcitycentral.com. Got a lot of cool articles up uh, about all Wisconsin sports at this time. So I know the brewers are at first team to 50 wins as of today. So if you want to check those good. out, you can, you can head out there. So, Thank you very much for listening, and uh, go Bucks. Of course.